foremost scholar, we may say the foremost uh, scholar in the world. Uh, with no further delay, Brother Tony Martin. research for many years, particularly into the life and work of Marcus Garvey, and the whole question of the Jewish involvement in the black experience is something which I was aware of in a vague, general kind of a way, but which I never really zeroed in on until, as fate would have it, I became embroiled in a controversy involving this very question. And as a historian, I found that being a historian, gave me a very unique opportunity to look at this whole question from a somewhat wider perspective than my own little personal involvement. So what my personal involvement did was that it triggered, I guess you might say, the historian in me. So I began to look at it both from my subjective involvement in it, but also standing back from it and looking at it in historical perspective. So what I did was that I put together this book which try to do these two things at the same time. That is to look at my specific situation, but also to look at it in the context of the ongoing deterioration of relations between black folks and Jews, especially, but not only, in the 20th century. As a historian, of course, like I said, it's impossible to teach African American history and not to have some interest in and some awareness of this whole question of black and Jewish relations. As a historian of Marcus Garvey, for example, I was especially aware of the fact that Garvey, many years ago, maybe 70 years or so ago, had also had his call of conflict and controversy concerning Jews. Garvey, like so many black folk, had a somewhat, a somewhat diverse and checkered history of dealing with Jews. There were some interludes of of uh, positive contact he had with Jews. There were several incidents of very negative contact. For example, Garvey, as you know, was sent to jail in 1925, um, allegedly for mail fraud, a charge which now all historians who study Garvey uh, read was a trumped up charge. It was a political charge. He should never have been sent to jail. But I remember doing my research being aware of the fact, although I didn't necessarily put it in a by the context that I was aware of the fact that the judge who sent Garvey to jail was a, a prominent Jew, a man by the name of Judge Julian Mack. And what I now know is that Julian Mack was not only just a, another Jewish judge, but he was one of the most, I guess, influential Jewish figures in America. He was one of the founders of um, Free. He was either a founder or sometime president of Free, of the major Jewish organizations. He was a uh, one time president, part founder of the American Jewish Committee. He was one of the founders of the American Jewish Congress. Those are still up to the day, two of the major Jewish organizations. Judge Mack was also president for a while of the Zionist Organization of America, the major Zionist organization in America. So here was this one judge who sent Darby to jail, who was at one time or another a head, a major figure, the leader of three of the major Jewish organizations. And there was one thing when I was doing my research that struck me, and I actually put it in my first book, Race First, although again, I didn't at the time have all of the background to put it into the kind of context that I could possibly not put it. And that was the fact that during Garvey's trial, the judge at one point had called all of the lawyers together, and he had told them that they should hurry up the trial because he said he had a Zionist 
meeting to go to in Chicago. The trial was here in New York, of course. And here was this judge, here was Marcus Garvey on trial, you know, man's life on the on the line. And the judge was telling them, well, hey man, you know, this comes, this is secondary to the fact that I have a Zionist meeting to go to. I want you all to hurry this child up, he said, because I have a Zionist meeting to go to in Chicago. Again, it's something which I put in the book, but again, I didn't have the context of the time and the background to maybe give it its full significance. The prosecutor who said that in the jail in that trial was also a Jewish um, prosecutor. His name was Maxwell Matter. I have been told, I haven't done any independent research, I'm told that a large number of the Jews also were Jews. And one of the things that struck me when I did that research was the fact that not only was Gabi being sent to jail on a trumped up, totally unjust charge, but the fact was that he was given the maximum of everything by this Jewish judge. He was given the maximum sentence possible, five years, so only one count. There was an indictment of several counts. Gabi was found guilty of only one of, I forget how many different counts. And um, he was given the maximum sentence for that one count, five years. The judge gave him the maximum fine. He also charged him with the entire costs of the trial. And for folks who are familiar with that kind of thing, you will know that the costs of a trial are often, as was the fact in Garvey's case, many, many times more than the maximum fine. The cost of the trial was something like about maybe 10 times or more, you know, the maximum fine. So this judge gave Garvey the maximum of everything it was within his power to give. The maximum years in jail, the maximum fine, charged him the entire costs of the trial. And of course this raises a whole bunch of other questions because this judge was not only a major Zionist and Jewish figure, he was also a member of the NAACP. <laughs> the National Association for the Advancement of Canopy. Or as Garvey used to say, the National Association for the Advancement of Certain People. And this of course raises a whole new set of questions, questions which I was not in a position to ask when I was writing Ways First, but which I now ask in this book, The Jewish Onslaught, because one of the interesting things that is now beginning to sort of fall into place as I look at this question with a sort of a new perspective is this. Now, the NWCP, which was founded in 1909, represents in African American history something very, very new. It represents, as far as I know, the first time the white people actually founded an organization supposedly for black people. Now even in the years prior to 1909, in the 18th century, in the 19th century, there were organizations among free black people. Most of them in the early, in the early years were sort of nationalist in perspective. But even those that were integrationist in perspective still used to have black leadership. You know, they might have desired to enter into the white mainstream but they were still founded by black people. They were led by black people. What happened with the NWCP for the first time in our history was that white folks intervened directly into the black movement, founded an organization allegedly for black people, financed and set the agenda, picked which black people were supposed to be on the executive, and ran it. What many of us forget is that the first national executive of the NAACP contained all of one black person, one. There was one black person, one. And the first national executive of the NAACP, that was W.E.B. Du Bois. My folk conceived the idea, they called the meeting, they decided who to invite. During the meeting, they then picked a committee from within the meeting who would appoint, you know, the um, working talent committee and so on. But at every stage, they were in charge of the whole handpicked business from start to finish. Now, if the NWCP represented for the first time white folk intervening this directly in black affairs, it also very interestingly represented the first time that I know of where Jews not only white uh, Gentiles, but Jews also became involved in this direct way. Now, prior to the NWCP in 1909, 
you know, there's a sort of a, a, a myth of Jewish liberalism as far as black people are concerned. But prior to 1909 and the founding of the NWCP, the Jewish relations to black folk in this country um, shows very little evidence of anything that can remotely be considered liberal. The whole Jewish relationship to black folk in this country prior to the end of the CP in 1909 is, for the most part, the relationship between slave and slave, and, 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 and between slave master and slave. The Jews were very integrally involved, like everybody else, in the whole slave business as slave masters. The largest slave ship owner in this country was a Jew, one Aaron Lopez from Newport, Rhode Island. The two largest shipments of slaves that came into New York in the 18th century came on ships owned by Jews. The second in command of the Confederacy during the Civil War was a Jew, a man called Judah Benjamin. Several other high-ranking members of the Confederacy were Jews as well. And if one goes south into the Caribbean and South America, then the Jewish involvement in slavery and the slave trade becomes even greater in places like Brazil, Curaçao, Suriname, Jamaica, Barbados, and various times, Jews are actually the dominant element in the slave trade in many of those areas. So prior to 1909, there's no question of any liberal Jew at all. The liberal Jew is basically invented in 1909 with the NWCP. And what you have with the NWCP is a further interesting paradox, because you have Jews like Judge Matt, who sent Garvey to jail who is the head of the Zionist Organization of America. Now the Zionist segment within the Jewish population, of course, represents the most nationalistic segment within the Jewish population. Just as within the African population you have nationalists and you have integrationists, you have the same kind of debate in the Jewish uh, group. There you have the Zionists who are the extreme nationalists on the one hand, on the other hand, you have what they call the assimilationists. And you have the fascinating phenomenon happening around the end of the city where Jews, who are the leaders of the nationalist wing within the Jewish group, then turn around and help to start an assimilationist organization for black people. Within their own group, they are totally anti-assimilation. <coughs> within their own group, they are pushing nationalism, they are pushing back to Israel, you know, uh, the, in Palestine as it was in those days, you know, they're all for Jewish nationalism, they're, they're against uh, intermarriage with Jews and so on. They're totally against what they call assimilation for Jews. But these same people who are against assimilation for Jews, then turn around and help to set up an organization for black people, which is pro-assimilation for black people. In other words, what they're saying is that for the Jews, the correct strategy for their empowerment is nationalism, but for us, it is assimilationism. And so you have the seemingly in Congress situation where Judge Julian Mack, the leader of the nationalist element among the Jewish group, is presiding over Marcus Garvey, the leader of the nationalist element among our group, and going out of his way to give Garvey the longest sentence, the biggest fine, and the cost of the entire trial. So what you have then is the Jewish nationalists declaring total war on African nationalism. And the question arises then, why? Why? Could it be that they realized that nationalism for black folk would lead to economic empowerment, as was Gavi was about, he was about economic empowerment. In fact, Gavi was highly successful. In fact, one of the reasons why the NAACP and many of the other integrationist organizations were so hostile to Gavi was precisely because he demonstrated the ability of black folk to succeed behind black leadership moving towards economic empowerment. Garvey was able to amass more money from black people to build his Black Star Line Steamship Corporation and his Negro Factories Corporation with a chain of businesses all over New York, restaurants, laundries, uh, hat factory, factory making uniforms for the organization, they had a trucking business, they had hotels, they had schools, a whole slew of businesses. Garvey was employing over a thousand people, in Harlem especially, in the early 1920s. And Garvey was able to amass more money from black folk to do those kinds of things than the NAACP was able to amass even from its Jewish and Gentile philanthropic helpers. So Garvey's success became a 
kind of a reproach to the integrationist effort. And so it may be that the Jews and others who were leading and establishing and funding and financing and directing the NAACP may very well have figured in, you know, in their strategy meetings or whatever that it was not in their interest for black folk to succeed economically. And who knows, that may be part of the reason why historically you find the same kind of, of, a, of, of hostility directed against nationalist organizations, be it the Gabi movement, be it the Nation of Islam, be it the entire black power movement, be it the Afrocentric movement that we are in the midst of now. But in all of these self-reliant nationalist kinds of eruptions within our community ever since 1909, Jews have often tended to be in the forefront of the opposition to these kinds of movements. So as a historian then, like I said, I was sort of aware of some of this kind of background. Now, of course, I'm much more aware and I can ask these kinds of questions and see these kinds of paradoxes. Just a few months before my particular case arose at Wellesley College, I had a most interesting experience, which as I look back at it now is just absolutely you know, strange and amazing. But I, I become interested in the question of Jewish emigration to Trinidad. I grew up in Trinidad. And I was doing some research in the old newspapers in Trinidad. And by accident, I began seeing all these articles in the newspapers in the 1930s and 40s about Jews, large numbers of Jews coming to Trinidad. Something that I wasn't aware of. Something that, that I'd never seen documented in any historical work. So I got interested in this. And I began to, you know, to write, you know, to research and eventually to write up a little paper on this question of Jewish immigration in Trinidad. And what I discovered eventually was that when Hitler began to run the Jews out of Austria and out of Germany and Czechoslovakia and elsewhere in Europe, they began scurrying around the world looking for safe haven. And Trinidad was actually one of the easiest places that they could get into. One of the great ironies is that despite the fact that this country is the world headquarters of Jewry and so on, during the 30s and 40s, America was one of the harder places for the Jews to get into. When Hitler began running them out of Europe, America didn't want them. Even the Jews, even the successful Jews here, were somewhat resistant towards bringing in the less fortunate Jews running from Hitler. And so it was the other places that they had to go. And Trinidad was one of those places where the immigration laws were fairly lax and they could get into Trinidad fairly easily and then they could wait until their number came up on the quota to get into the States, as many of them did eventually. So I began, I began to research that whole question and I'm still researching it. But while researching all that, I went to a Jewish archive a few months before my editing started in Wesley, a Jewish archive in New York City here, one of the major Jewish organizations, which was involved in funding the immigrants, the Jewish immigrants to Trinidad. And that's a whole fascinating story in itself. The way these people came to Trinidad, penniless, without a cent. Organizations from this country sent them money, set them up in business, you know, helped them to get around all the various bureaucratic problems in Trinidad and so on. And these Jews eventually were able to amass considerable amounts of money in Trinidad, you know, pay back these folks over here and leave Trinidad with a net profit having extracted, you know, considerable profits from Trinidad and eventually come up here and re-establish themselves. But that's a whole other story. But, but when I visited these archives, the lady in charge of the archives, um, first of all, you know, was somewhat surprised at my presence. These archives were done in Midtown, in a very large building, and I remember to get up there, I had to go up in an elevator, I forget how many floors it was, but when one came out of the elevator, one came out into a little kind of a little hallway, and there were no doors anyway. Anyway, you were in a hallway, facing a whole bunch of closed doors, and you had to speak through a little microphone or something, and somebody could see you from inside through some kind of a one-way closed circuit television or something. So they could see me, I couldn't see them, like, like I was speaking to a voice with no face to it. And for a while, they didn't want to open the door. They saw a black face out there, and um, someone reluctant to open the door, and I was questioned, and, Grill. Luckily, I had called them on the phone and written them from Wellesley, so they realized they had already made a commitment to me on the phone to come in there. And I found that so interesting because it's almost impossible to go to any 
black archive without finding Jewish scholars all over the place. Yeah. You, you almost have to, you know, find them even to get to the material. One of our major archives, the Morland Spengarn Collection at Howard University, is named after a Jew, Spengarn. Uh -oh. Another one of our major archival collections, which I won't name, has at least one Jewish um, librarian that I know of working right inside there. You know, if you as a black historian go to the archive, you have to ask a Jewish woman to please bring you a black document to me. But I turned up with this Jewish archive and it took them several minutes before they decided whether to open the door for me or not. However, once I, once I got inside, the lady in charge then began to question me. She said, do you know them Jeffries? <laughs> <laughs> So I guess that was my next first test, you know, so I'm saying to myself, Dan, you know, what, you know, what should I say, you know? Will she say I can't do the research if I say yes? But I said yes, I know Len Jeffries, you know, we go to Black Studies, you know, how, how can I not know Len Jeffries? I've known her for many years. I'm not sure what she expected me to say, but she seemed somewhat put back by my answer. <laughs> then she asked me uh, if I had read the secret relationship between Blacks and Jews. I guess you're trying to figure out whether I was a good person to be allowed to go into the archives or not. Yeah. Truthfully, I hadn't read it at that time. But by some strange coincidence, on the way to her archive, I had passed a brother selling it on the sidewalk at 34th Street. So I said, no, I haven't read it yet, you know, but I, I just passed somebody selling it. So she began to try and propagandize me against the book. And I remember saying to her, having not read the book yet, but just on general principles, and it's so ironic in the light of what developed around me later on. But I remember saying to her, I don't see what the fuss is about, you know. I, I said to her that everybody knows that white folk enslaved black people. And if Jews were an important part of white society, and they also enslaved African people. You know, what's the fuss about, you know? You know why are you so upset that a book should document this? And she really couldn't answer that question. She never did answer that question. She then went on to ask me about Corn Heights, by way of Corn Heights. <laughs> so, you know, I live in Boston, but I've heard about it, and I've read, read about it. She then informed me that Bianca Rosenbaum <laughs> had been uh, doing research in that same archive, and this is where it got to be totally off the wall. And as I look back at it now, I'm just totally weird. She says Bianca Rosenbaum was doing research right there in the same archive. So, so. Uh, I'm not sure what the conclusion was from that. Um, <laughs> she, even, she even told me that they used to put her stuff on the same table where she brought you know, all my messages. <laughs> so up to now, I haven't been able to figure this out. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a more strange and weird kind of episode. I don't know what this means, but it's, it's totally, totally strange. It's, it's almost bizarre. At the time, of course, all I was interested in was getting my research on Jewish immigration to Trinidad. I hadn't even read the secret relationship. Well, I did indeed read the secret relationship a few months later on, and haven't read it. I liked it. I thought it was a nice book. For years, I have been teaching African American history. I've taught the role of Christians in the slave trade, you know, Baptists and Methodists and Moravians and Catholics and Quakers and all kinds of other people. You know, I've, I've thought about Muslims in the slave trade, but I was only dimly aware of the role of Jews in the slave trade. So when I read this book, you know, this was a, a kind of revelation to me. You know, I, I'd heard about it, but I wasn't very, very aware of it. So this book came as a kind of a revelation to me, the secret relationship between blacks and Jews put out by the Historical Research Department of the Nation of Islam. So naturally, I decided to add this new material to my course. You know, as a good professor, I. I'm constantly looking for new stuff, new information. You know, I keep changing around the readings. You know, I mean, no, no professor who is worth anything teaches the same stuff for 20 years. So here was some new exciting material and I added it to the course. I actually taught it for one whole semester and nothing happened in my West Indian course, my Caribbean course. But the book deals with both the Caribbean and African American. When I taught it in my African American course the second time around, I guess at that point somebody gave up to what was happening. And that's when the whole interesting chain of events began to happen. Now, there's a, a Jewish student organization called Hillel, the Hillel Foundation, H-I-L-L-E-L. -L -E 
and I refer to them as the shock troops, Jewish shock troops on campus. They are part of the Bene Brith conglomerate. The Bene Brith are the kind of a over, you know, overall kind of a head group under which the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League, comes. The Anti-Defamation League is part of this whole Bene Brith business. And, and, um, and the Hillel Foundation is like a kind of a student arm, almost, of the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League. So two or three students from this Hillel group claim later on that they saw the book among my offerings in the school bookstore and decided to sit in on my class on the first day of class to see, quote unquote, how I was teaching the book. They seemed to think that the book should be taught as hate literature, but they were very disappointed and disgusted to discover that I was teaching the book as any other historical work to show one other aspect of the slave trade. So that they considered to be a hateful act on my part. It wasn't hateful to show the role of Christians in the slave trade, but it was hateful to show the role of Jews. In other words, as I subsequently asked, what I asked later on is so special about the Jews. You know, who put the Jews beyond the reach of historical inquiry? Why is it to study, why is it okay to study academically every group in the world, but the Jews somehow are out of bounds, especially when they are all over our history? Up to about 10, 15, 20 years ago, if you went into a black bookstore in the heart of the black community, I can guarantee you that maybe half or more of the books you would have seen in there would have been written by Jews. Jews have been all over our history and over everything else in this 20th century. Up to today, if you were to go to any university in this country and talk to any white or Negro professor, Negro professor, one who hasn't you know, yet discovered his blackness. <laughs> right now, if you go to any university right now and ask any one of these kinds of people, who is the most authoritative historian of just you know, almost any aspect of our experience? Chances are they will call some Jew. They may call Gilbert Africa, they may call August Meyer, they may call Gutman, uh, they may call Lawrence Levine. Levine is the one who really um, amazes me most of all because he is supposed to be the greatest expert on black culture. <laughs> culture. Imagine that. Culture. <laughs> the foremost expert on black culture is a Jew. <laughs> and so they become so used to dominating and dictating at all levels, not only at the level of being in graduate schools and having a great say so in who gets a PhD in the first place, but also they're very powerfully involved in the publishing houses when you as a black scholar or white scholar for that matter you know write your manuscript send it to a publishing house there's a good chance it's going to be sent to a jewish scholar to you know to have a look at it to decide whether it's worth publishing or not etc 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 so at all strategic levels they have a great leverage you know great control over the, um, the black history and black studies basically business so it may be that the rise of black studies in the 1960s and then the rise of black professors on campus may have been seen by some of them as a threat to their vested interest over the interpretation of our reality. And of course, thanks to the computer and the whole desktop publishing revolution, for the last 10, 15, 20 years, our country has been in the midst of a great democratization of information. In the old days, you had to go to a big company to get your book published. Nowadays, anybody with a computer can put out a very tolerable looking book right there in the privacy of their own bedroom if they want to. It could be a hallway, any place. As long as there's an electric outlet, you can publish a book that's going to look just as good sitting next to the shelf as something put out by Oxford University Press or Random House or anything else. So the Black Books Revolution got a little space in this new democratization of the publishing industry. And so the Black Books Revolution has come. A major development for us because it has freed us for the first time from dependence on other people, Jews and Gentiles. And now it's therefore much more difficult for those who control our intellectual experience to maintain that control because a whole slew of black publishing companies has come into being. And a lot of black authors, very many from an Afrocentric perspective, are now able to get their books into the marketplace. And so, a book like A Secret Relationship represents 
everything that I've just said. Here's a black book with a very strong black perspective, looking at our history, but also looking at their history from our perspective. They can't control it. In the case of this particular book, they didn't even know who wrote it. Every time I go on the radio debating uh, one of these Jews, I was on this last Saturday debating the head of the American Jewish Committee for the fourth time. We went to the tour for four hours on one of the big talk shows there in Boston. A most grueling event. Imagine for four hours having to deal with somebody whose basic game plan is to lie and scurrilously defame you and defame black folk and have to deal with that for four straight hours. I felt that I'd gone 15 rounds with Muhammad Ali or somebody when I was going to <laughs> Nevertheless, you know, one of the points that keep those in those settings is, well, who wrote the book? We don't even know who wrote the book. And what I normally tell them is, look, man, the Anti-Defamation League for years has been putting all these scurrilous, defamatory books about black people. Who wrote those books? You know, those, those books by the ADL never used to have any authors on them. And very interestingly enough, it's only since I've begun raising this point that the latest ADL book on black folk now for the first time has a author on it. It's very interesting. It's only since I've started making this point in the last few months, all of a sudden now <laughs> they're trying to clean up their act with an author. So, folks became upset because I was teaching this book. Now these students at Hillel, like I said, Hillel is a network, a national network of these Jewish student bodies, and they're very well, well organized, very well funded. There's a book put out by a former congressman called Paul Finley. They, they dare to speak out. People and groups confront the Israel lobby. And Paul Finley is a former congressman from the Midwest someplace who was unseated by the Jewish lobby, lost the seat in Congress because he became a friend of the Palestinian struggle and so on. And with the benefit of hindsight, of course, he put together this very valuable and interesting book dealing with the tactics of these Jewish groups when they target folks for destruction. And so, what I discovered in Paul Finley's book was that the Hidden Groups on Campus are formally trained in dirty tricks by APAC, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, which is reputedly one of the most powerful lobbying groups in this country. They lobby at Congress and so on, on behalf of Israel and on behalf of other Jewish um, you know, concerns, APAC, AIPAC. And APAC, Paul Finley um, shows, he demonstrates, he documents it in his book. They formally, you know, the Jews don't even have anything in chance, they formally have training sessions with these other folks on how to harass black folk. You know, if a black person is coming to speak, how to try to get the invitation rescinded. If that can't be done, how to put scholars stuff in a newspaper. They study black speakers. And, and in advance of a black speaker going to the campus, they will, they will uh, send a little kind of a breakdown for the local Hillary group. They will tell the Hillary group what kind of questions the speaker answers well. So don't ask him those kind of questions, you know. What kind of questions. He, you know, these, these people, you know, they do a lot of research. They have the money, of course, and they, they don't leave anything to chance. So Hillary groups, uh, like I said, these are serious truths in this Jewish onslaught against black people. At my own campus of Wellesley, before my situation developed, the Hillary group had gone into action two or three times in a couple of years before my situation. Reverend Al Sharpton came to speak at Wellesley, and they were all over the place trying to get, them, get him uninvited. That failed, they were in the press talking foolishness. They even accused him of advocating genocide. Can you believe that? There was no documentation, I have no idea what they were talking about. But they said that this man, Preaches genocide, don't bring him to the campus. When they couldn't keep him off the campus, they then told the administration, they demanded that the administration give them money to set up a counter program, a counter Al Sharpton. <laughs> and these are typical you know, of the kinds of tactics that they employ. Mm -hmm. Dr. Ben came to our campus, Dr. Benjamin Hannah, and the same kind of thing happened. One of the Jewish professors there, a woman called Lefkowitz, she was there in the audience, literally heckling him, disrupting question time and so on. There was a guy called Edward Saeed, a Palestinian figure who came to the campus as well. The same kind of scurrilous attacks took place. In fact, one of them got into the you know, campus newspaper and even called upon Wellesley College to 
you know, uh, you know, telling Muslim Palestinians that they should be ashamed of themselves for allowing somebody who favored the Palestinian position to speak, as though to favor the Palestinian position was some kind of a crime. <laughs> so when I came on the scene, then these were the same kinds of folks who had already, you know, kind of done some experience with Shafton and Dr. Ben and so on. These were the same kind of folks who tried to mobilize against me. And the way they moved against me was typical again of the way Jews move generally when they, you know, try to target somebody. What they did was to go to who they <coughs> perceived of as being in a position to do me grievous economic harm. That's the way they operate. They try to move your job, the five year when I live, that's the way they go. So they went straight to the president, the dean, the associate dean, the chair of the department. Only after all that, they came to me. So I invited them to come to my class. I said, well, hey, man, you think that it is anti-Semitic to teach black students and Jews who are involved in the slave trade. Well, come to my class and we'll have a nice discussion. But what I discovered then, and I could have guessed it, was that these kind of folk really can't deal with open discussion. Their whole agenda is geared towards clandestine activity, lies, innuendo, scurrilous attacks. But the last thing they want is an open discussion because they know they don't have any real basis. I discovered this the first time I, I, I debated the American Jewish Committee guy on radio. You know, he basically looked foolish, he had nothing to say. We debated for two or three hours that first time, he had nothing to say. In fact, what I discovered was that he didn't even know his own history. Right. He claimed to have a Jewish history. You can hear so many of these Jews think that the first Jews came to this country in 1880. In fact, one of the major scholars, Nathan Glaser, a Harvard University scholar, he actually wrote in his book that Jews, you know, have no responsibility for exterminating the Native Americans or enslaving Africans because the Jews weren't even here before 1880. Jews were the first Europeans to come here. They came with Columbus. They were the major slaveholders in Brazil right after Columbus and in the Caribbean. They were here in this country from the 1600s. These are Sephardic Jews. But here is a Jew with a PhD in black history of all things. He doesn't even know this. And this, of course, led me to, to wonder about this great interest that they all have in our experience, you know. It's as though I'm beginning to feel out that there are more Jews studying black history than studying their own history. And one of the things that I believe is that our scholars now are ready, as we have already begun to do, but have to continue now to study their history as well. Maybe we can outflank them. You know, like, while they're studying us, we don't study them. And this is a noise them greatly. The only thing that annoys them more than us taking charge of our own history is us moving into the offenses that they are stuck with. So I, for one, have decided to become an expert in Jewish history. One of the things I'm going to do next is I'm going to start a scholarly journal. I'm going to mention the black book. So like I said, you have to move from the defensive to the offensive. That's right. We kind of got up to the boxes into a corner forever. We're going to find our way onto the corner and not find them. Mm -hmm. It's like when. Free. Like when our great African general Hannibal invaded. Rome. You know, he went to Rome, he stayed there for 15, 16 years, and the Romans couldn't beat him. So what did the Romans do? They left him right there in Rome, and they came to Carthage. They left him in Rome, and came across to Carthage, and we were able to defeat Carthage while Hannibal was still in Rome. So let us both defend, in our case, let us not leave Carthage undefended, but let us defend Carthage, you know, but let us also move and deal with them. And, and they can't deal with it, because in my various discussions and debates with them, I, I noticed that one of the things that perhaps you know, annoys them most of all is the widespread um, sort of argument you get in the black community today is suggesting that these white Jews are true Jews at all in the first place. You know, that seems to bother them greatly. They have a very great desire to associate themselves with whiteness. In fact, one of the things I quote in the book is a, is a guy out of Brooklyn, 
There's a Jewish newspaper or the book in the Jewish press, which calls itself the largest um, English-speaking Jewish weekly newspaper in the country. It's also perhaps the most bigoted. There's a columnist in there, a man who calls himself Prof. Edelson, he writes, I guess, just about the review. And he was an article along these lines. And he was actually saying, in effect, hey, you're white, you're white, you're Caucasian, you're Caucasian. And he was saying that all these black folks are saying that the original Jews were black, and now he's saying the skinheads and the Ku Klux Klans and the Nazis and whatnot are following, you know, following the leader of the black folk now and saying we're white, you're white, you're white. Because one thing that I discovered, in, in, in the course of reflecting on my situation, is that it seems to me historically in this country that black folk have provided the Jews their sort of comfort level. Yeah. Now, if you look at Europe, and this is another irony, you know, all the energy that the Jews here have exercised attacking black people, you know, but black folk have never really done them anything. Right. Mm -hmm. All the pogroms in history, you know, one young girl goes and accidentally got killed in front of they call it a pogrom. <laughs> but the real pogroms when they used to run around just killing them, slaughtering them in Eastern Europe and stuff, all the real pogroms, all the real holocausts that they have, you know, have to experience, all the countries that have expelled them, and every single country in Europe almost has expelled the Jews at one time or another. All the inquisitions, all the destructions of the communities, whether it's the Romans in Jerusalem or wherever, all of that oppression that they had to deal with historically has come from Europeans. <laughs> and yet you have this great paradox. These folks are some of the world's greatest recipients of European uh, you know, oppression. They are the ones in this society who are trying to, you know, wave the European flag more than the Europeans themselves, mm -hmm. especially in this period. Mm -hmm. We are living in a period when the white supremacy is again wearing this ugly head, and you find so many Jews in the forefront mm. of the white supremacy movement. And you find people like Prof. Adelson in the Jewish time and Jewish press talking about we are Caucasians, we are Caucasians, getting very upset. If people say to them, well, look, your own Jew, um, Kirsten, wrote in his book, The Philippines Tribe, that most of the wild Jews in the world today are actually European converts. Of course, they are. They got the Eskenazi. Eskenazi. European converts. Kazakhs. Converted around the 8th century or something. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And this is Kirsten with the Jew himself, right? In this time. Now, it seems to me that, like I said, we have provided their comfort level at every stage in history. Now, if you look at the history of Jews in the United States of America, insofar as you can consider the U.S. of A a European country, the U.S. of A is the only European country, the only important European country where Jews have never been um, hassled, never. Jews have never been victimized, they have never been oppressed in this country, never, ever. There's no record in this country of any anti-Jewish anything. Yes, some, you know, they get to paint a swastika on a wall every once in a while or something, but that's not the oppression. The kind of oppression that these folks are used to has never happened in this country. On the contrary, from the very beginning, Jews in this country have always been among, you know, the elites. Okay, during slavery, they were among the most important slave owners. When slavery ended in the 20th century and so on, you know, they became very rich through Hollywood, through other kinds of business enterprises. And it seems to me that they have always used the African population as a kind of a leverage to get that kind of acceptance. Now, when, what they have done very skillfully, I think, is to size up whatever is the prevailing attitude among mainstream white elite in any given period and then they try to attach themselves to that mainstream attitude mm -hmm. and to even put themselves at the front of it. Mm -hmm. So if slavery is the prevailing attitude, they want to be the biggest slave owners. And that is their way of proving to the white establishment that yes, we are as white as you, we are part of your whole thing. We can, we can enslave Africans just as well as you are or even better. In the 20th century, when Jews begin to move into the leadership of the NAACP, 
that too becomes a way of them leveraging into the white mainstream. Because what apparently was beginning to happen around the time that the NAACP started was that the Eastern European Jews who had come in relatively recently were beginning to become very wealthy. They were the ones who were establishing Hollywood and inventing Hollywood as, as, as Neil Glaber says in his book. So they were full of money, but they still didn't have the kind of social prestige, the entree into the top old money social circles commensurate with the kind of money they had. And so by getting into the world of philanthropy for black people, see philanthropy for, for black people had been dominated prior to this time by the old liberal white elite, the old New England, New York, the Eastern Seaboard white elite, the children and grandchildren of the old abolitionists, people like that. These were the ones who were into, and these were, these were very rich people, wealthy people, elite people, old money, but they were also liberal, and so they were the ones who were for many years, you know, like I said, they had been abolitionists during slavery, and that tradition had continued. So by the beginning of this century, that element, who were the most prestigious liberal element in the country, were the ones in charge, so to speak, of philanthropy to black organizations and so on. So by the Jews entering the world of philanthropical assistance to black people, that was a way of them getting entree now, getting an entry into these white liberal elite circles. In other words, by giving money to black folk in the NWCP and these areas, they then got to sit down, you know, to sit down side by side in the same bodies, the same organizations now, with these rich Gentiles of liberal persuasion. So that gave them a kind of an entree now into that liberal East Coast white Gentile establishment, something that the money alone had not yet bought them. So once again, even though appearing to be liberal, they were actually using that apparent liberalism once more to consolidate their position in the white Gentile mainstream. Today, as white America seems to be moving conservative, once again, you find the Jewish uh, leadership again trying to associate itself with that conservatism and to put itself in the vanguard and the forefront of that kind of conservatism. Which is why like today you'll find people like you know, Professor Michael Levin here is talking about, you know, white men have done all the most violent things in the history of the world. All the art, all the literature, all the technological advances he says in the history of the world are attributable to, to white men, he says. I was listening to a show on WABC that somebody came and somebody asked them, well, how can you as a Jew say that? Isn't that what the Nazis said about you and your people? You just brush that aside. So, in my situation then, like I said, I saw the, you know, typical kind of strategies being employed. There were the lies. There was the attempt to move against me economically. There was the attempt, the very successful attempt to mobilize the press. Now Jews get very upset when you say they control the press. They even get upset if you say that they have a great deal of influence in the press. But yet, what is the, you know, what's the reality? If you look at a Jewish author by the name of uh, Silverman, he wrote a book, Charles Silverman, he wrote a book in 1985 in which he pointed out that all seven, he said, all seven of the top editors, there were seven top editors at the New York Times, he said, all seven were Jews. The New York Times itself he described as a Jewish own. These are his words. Charles Silverman, Jewish author. <coughs> Jewish owned paper. He went on to list the whole list of names of the major anchor people on television who were all Jews. Some had Jewish names, some had Gentile names, but the word Jews all the same. Mike Wallace, Barbara Walters, Marvin Kalb, Ted Koppel, and many others, all Jews. He went on to say that Jews not only owned the major TV networks, and not only occupied you know, many of the major anchor person slots, but he said that the greatest concentration of Jews in television was among the producers. The producers, he explained, were those who decided what stories went on the air, how much time was given to each story, what slant was put on it, what order the stories appeared in. 
So in a sense, when it came to influencing the public, the producers were even more important and influential than even the other people, perhaps. And this is Silverman, the Jew, saying in his book that here, among the producers on television, he said, is where you found the greatest concentration of Jews, even more than among the other persons and so on. We all know that the major Hollywood studios, you know, um, have had a, a predominant Jewish ownership and so on. The same is true for major weekly newspapers, and the same is true for a variety of other major newspapers besides the New York Times. Papers like the um, Wall Street Journal, for example, and many others. So if that doesn't amount to major Jewish influence over the press, I don't know what does. And in my own case, it became very apparent, because what happened in my case was that First of all, the Jewish group began by trying to monopolize the school newspaper, which they did fairly successfully. The school newspaper was used to attack me week after week. Then I published, no, I wrote an article defending myself, and the school newspaper refused to publish it. At which point they thought, well, they had me, it was all over, but what I did next surprised them, took them by surprise. What I did next was that I published my statement as a, what I call broadside number one a newsletter which I then distributed around the country and overseas as well, several thousand copies. And one side number one, up to now I think has been reproduced in its entirety in I think about five or six publications, including at least one in the Caribbean and the, and the rest here in this country. And everywhere it went, people ran off hundreds of copies and so on. So it had a very great impact. And that's the last thing they expected. So once that happened, and they realized that they could not contain me within the confines of the college, then four of the major Jewish organizations became involved in my situation. What started off as a campus thing, when they realized that they couldn't contain it, they then went to the outside organizations. And so you had the Anti-Defamation League, the American Jewish Committee, the American Jewish Congress, and the Jewish Community Relations Council, four of the most powerful of the Jewish organizations, they all got together, issued a joint press release against me on April 5th of this year. The release called upon my school to fire me. I'm a tenured professor. They called upon the school to, you know, to um, take another look at my tenure with a view to firing me. This is a major newspaper, the major newspaper in Boston. Four articles in six days, including an editorial. An editorial. I mean, the Boston Globe gave, you know, a whole editorial. A whole editorial. They, they called it Hate Literature as History. When the Anti-Defamation League was found spying on you know, 1,200 people or 900 other organizations or whatnot, major story in the West Coast. That story ran for months and months and months and months on the West Coast. And the East Coast newspapers would not run a word on it. Mm. Major story. I mean, yeah, the ADL yeah. was indicted in San Francisco, you know. The, the offices were raided in San Francisco and Los Angeles. You would never have known anything, you know, from reading the, the, the right. major white press That's over right. here on the East Coast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But here was something as relatively inconsequential as me teaching one day's worth of readings from a book they didn't like, and there was a whole editorial. Yeah. And if this doesn't give you an idea of their power over the press, then I don't know what does. Their power to, to, to elevate into importance what they want and to remain silent about what they don't want you to hear. <coughs> of course, exposure to the press is a two-edged sword. They can't attack me in the press and not expect black folk to read it. You know, you go. Black folk read the same papers. And so, that too, it worked with their community, but of course it backfired in my community because most black folk are sensible enough to see a story like that and read through, you know, between the lines and read through the pool. You know, black folk have been exposed to this stuff long enough to realize what was happening. And so part of the perhaps unintended result of their press attacks on me was a whole outpouring of black support, which was most encouraging. And I must say I've been very um, impressed by black support. I, I get the feeling that black folk are now at a high level of consciousness, perhaps higher than maybe at any time in our history. I mean, it's almost frightening, the, the level of consciousness among our people today. And I saw it in the outpouring of letters and phone calls, you know, all kinds of folks from people I didn't know, 
prisoners, people I knew, people I had taught years ago, but all kinds of people. There was this outpouring, and there was a very instinctive recognition that what they were reading was live. You know, it's, it's amazing. People just instinctively knew. Didn't matter what the paper said. They could call me a racist, a bigot, an anti-Semite, but black folk just instinctively knew. Without even knowing all the facts, but there was an instinctive, you know, ability to, 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 to read through the foolishness and know that the papers were telling lies. I, I found that the black radio talk shows were perhaps the most militant of all the black media. Some black papers are still a little timid, not all by any means. You know, there were one or two who were afraid to touch the story until the major press, you know, started it, then they kind of jumped in behind the major press, and they were okay from that point on. But I find that the black radio talk shows were on the cutting edge of um, fearless, you know, black journalism. And I think this is a very, a very um, heartening sign. Certainly since I published this book, The, the Jewish Onslaught, you know, which, which came out about, about a week ago, the response to the book so far, again, demonstrates that great level of consciousness among black folk, you know, I mean, the, the interest which, which it has uh, created and the way that folks are trying to get a hold of it, again, suggests that, that the black folk, I believe, have largely overcome whatever fear there might have been of, of Jewish power in the past, which is not to say that there are not still a whole bunch of hirelings, house <coughs> toms, house negroes, call them what you want, there are still lots of folks like that out there, but I think that these kind of folks are perhaps more isolated and exposed as far as the black community is concerned than ever before. And this brings me to another aspect of my situation, because from the very first day almost that the Hillel Jews on my campus began to mobilize against me, the name of Henry Lewis Gates came up on the campus. One of the first things they did was to duplicate and, and pass around an editorial, an op-ed piece, but Henry Lewis Gates, also known as Skip Gates, head of Afro-American Studies at Harvard University, there was this famous or infamous piece he did in the New York Times a year or so ago called uh, Black Demagogues and Pseudo-Scholars, in which he called you know, black intellectuals anti-Semitic and so on. He has emerged over the years now as what I call in, in the book African American's most notorious Judeophile, that is a you know, Jew-loving, black person. He's the best known. He has been amply rewarded, of course, for his efforts. He went to an anti-defamation league conference at Brandeis University a few months ago and said, and made, made headlines in the Boston Globe, he said that the black middle class, especially the young and well-educated black professionals, were now the most anti-Semitic group in the country. Good. He said we were all so ungrateful because Jews had helped us out during the civil rights era. Him and his wife. And his wife, wife. <laughs> Maybe we can just digress a minute and look at the kind of help we got in the civil rights era. For most of the history of the NWCP, Jews have been the head of the NWCP, the chairman and, and the presidents. There's usually been a black person up front, the executive secretary, but the real head, the chair of the board of directors or whatever. The president, they have all been Jews up, up to 1975. The NWCP got its first black chair in 1975. Mm. Mm. And for most of the period, almost, you know, for most of the period prior to that, the uh, chairs were, were Jews. One of the chairs who was ahead of the NWCP for decades, about 30 years or so, was a man called Joel Spingarn, who I mentioned before. Teach. Joel Spingarn. That's right. And now we discover based on the revelations that came out earlier this year, published in the Memphis Commercial Appeal. Oh, yes, yes. Now we have discovered that Spingarn, uh -huh. while he was head of the NWCP, he was spying for the U.S. military intelligence on the same NWCP that he was head of. That's right. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of help we've been getting from the yeah. Jews in the civil rights movement. Yeah. Yeah. A couple of years before Spingarn took up his spy position, he called a conference a famous conference that black folk have been studying for years, those of us who do African-American history. The Armenia Conference, they call it. He had a conference, he had a bigger state, someplace upstate New York. He had this Armenia Conference and he called together the entire leadership of the integrationist, you know, mainstream, you know, black movement, all of them. Du Bois and a whole bunch of them. Those who had followed Booker T. Washington, you know, Booker T. had just died. 
those who had followed Booker T. Washington, those who were in the NWCP, allied with Du Bois and so on. He called all of them. This man, this Jewish man, summoned, literally summoned the entire black leadership to his estate. Put up two or three tents in the yard, fed them well, <laughs> had them discuss what's the best strategy to deal with black folk. You know, and then he is taking the whole thing out. Can you imagine that? <laughs> Can you imagine me as a black man calling the entire leadership of the anti death Mission League, American Jewish Committee, come to my house to sit in my living room to discuss what's the best strategy for Jews against black people while I sit down there and take notes so I can go back and tell the military intelligence department. Mm. Mm. And this shows the level of naivete among our people. Yes, Teach. The same thing was happening as late as the 1980s, in the mid-1980s, and I, I mentioned this in the book here as well. I think it was 1985. The World Zionist Organization commissioned a Jewish woman called Kitty Cohen to go to the Congressional Black Caucus and do a poll. Can you imagine this? This is the Congressional Black Caucus. These are our elected leaders in Congress. This Jewish woman walks into the office. She says, look, Mr. Whatever, Congressman, my name is Kitty Cohen. I am from the World Zionist Organization. Could you tell me who you consider the major leaders in African America? What do you think of Minister Farrakhan? What do you think of Jesse Jackson? All these kinds of questions. And these people are sitting down there giving this information to this Jewish woman. Then she goes back and fortifies it, of course, and they have then, of course, planned a strategy based on this. I believe something like about 16 or of about 22 or so black Congress people actually cooperated with this woman. They sat down and gave her the information. The same thing was happening during the civil rights era of, of the 1950s and 60s. Now we know that Martin Luther King's major advisor was a Jew from New York, a man by the name of Stanley Levison. I was reading a book by a Jew the other day, um, Broken Alliance, by a guy called Kaufman, a Jew. And he was saying in this book, and I have no reason to doubt him. First of all, he said that 75% of the funding for the uh, civil rights movement, for the main organization, SNCC and CORE and so on, were coming from Jews. I have no reason to doubt him. Then he said that Stanley Levison was King's major advisor. He said Stanley Levison was doing King's taxes, was in charge of his finances. He said Levison was King's major strategist. This Jewish man was the major strategist planning King's strategy. What blew my mind most of all was when Kaufman said that Levison was drafting many of King's speeches. Nice. So, you know, what, what kind of cooperation is that? That's not cooperation, that's control. Mm -hmm. That's direction. Yeah. Now, that civil rights group, the Kings and the Andrew Youngs and stuff, they had a rude awakening in 1979 when Andrew Young was fired from his post as U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations. And why was he fired? Because he had a meeting with the PLO. We know now that the rest of them have been you know, meeting with the PLO for a long time, secretly too. They had a big signing with Arafat the other day. And they brought back Andrew Young to witness that signing. And I don't know what was going through Andrew Young's head because he was fired for the same thing that they were celebrating. And then they had a goal to invite him and he was ignorant enough to accept the invitation <laughs> and sit down there like it nothing happened. <laughs> and President Carter, who fired him, was there getting all the kudos and everybody passing Carter on the back for being such a great, you know, um, person having such great foresight. I, I don't know what was going through Andrew Young's head. Maybe he had a bottle of amnesia. Maybe he forgot what happened. I don't know. Maybe, maybe he got some money. <laughs> but when Andrew Young was fired in 1979, the black mainstream integrationist establishment had a rude awakening because they realized for the first time that, hey, you know, the Jewish pressure, <laughs> that they weren't immune from Jewish pressure. See, they were the ones who had worked closely with the Jews over the years. <coughs> but they found that even they, the integrationist mainstream establishment, weren't beyond Jewish pressure when the Jews considered it in their interest to move against them. And the Jews moved against Andrew Young just as ruthlessly as they moved against anybody else. And that became a great shock to the mainstream establishment. And what did they do? They convened a meeting here in New York at the NWCP headquarters. Beautiful. And they issued a declaration that they called 
a declaration of independence. All the mainstream black leaders signed it. All the Jesse Jacksons and the Walter Fontroys and all the Dorothy Heights and the Carter Scott Kings and all those kinds of folks were there. They all signed it. Julian Bond, all these kinds of folks signed it. And they issued this document, the Declaration of Independence, which said that from now on they said black folk must finance black organizations. Yes. Otherwise we'll always be, you know, um, at the mercy of these other kinds of folks. In fact, what they said was surprisingly strong. They didn't live up to what they said, but nevertheless, <laughs> it was surprisingly strong. <laughs> Julian Bond was the man who authored the uh, draft of this document, you know, on Jews. And, and they said straight up that you know, he accused the Jews of, uh, you know, um, keeping black folk in bad faith. He accused them of moving against black affirmative action in the Baki case, the Supreme Court case, where the Jews entered the case and <coughs> successfully defeated the whole concept of affirmative action for black people. And the great irony of the Jews defeating affirmative action for black people was that the Jews themselves are the world's greatest recipients of affirmative action. I don't know what the figure is for the day, but as of 1985, the Jews had received $70 billion in reparations from Germany. $70 billion. So you, you know that the figure must be over $100 billion now. And that $70 billion in 1985 didn't even include US aid to Israel and that kind of stuff. That was only direct, direct compensation to individuals, you know, who, um, of, of Jewish, well, Jewish individuals. So these folks who by now must have received over a hundred billion dollars worth of direct reparations plus Lord knows how many more billions in the form of US aid, these same folks went to extraordinary lengths to prevent black folk getting two or three places in medical schools by way of affirmative action quotas. Then had the goal to turn around and say that it was because they favored a meritocracy, merit. That's the big argument these days, that, that you know, everything they got was based on merit. Merit. Just yesterday I was listening to a tape, which I think this brother here is selling. <laughs> There's a tape I bought when I was here last time, uh, the Call Nights thing that the Lombard Brad had. And I was listening to that tape in my car last night, and I was, I was very shocked to hear somebody, I think it was Utrecht Reed or somebody, was, was talking about um, the fact that the Hasidic group in, 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 in Brooklyn, you know, was able to manipulate the city and state government apparatus to get all kinds of benefits to their group at taxpayer expense. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, what they got, you know, what I listened to her saying on the tape, that alone must be worth several hundred times the two or three places in medical school that they were trying to give black people in, in the back case. Mm -hmm. But again, they would be the first to tell you that they got it because of merit. Mm -hmm. Meritocracy, they call it. Mm -hmm. Whatever they get is based on meritocracy. Hard words. Whatever black folk get, it's well, based on, on something else, something that black folk don't deserve. Quota, yeah. Quota queen, they were calling Lani Grenier. <clears throat> Which brings us to the whole question of, of, of Jewish racism. Because what I discovered in looking at the Jewish press around my case and generally is that there's an intense, intense racism coming out of the Jewish press. I hadn't really read the Jewish newspapers with any regularity prior to my situation, but reading the Jewish press was a hell of a you know, a, a revelation to me because there's a, a, an intense anti-African, you know, sentiment that you get coming through the Jewish newspapers. They almost never refer to black leaders without appending some derogatory epithet. <laughs> Every black person they mention you know, is either a charlatan or a bigger or a racist or something like that, you know. They can't call a black person's name without appending something like that to the uh, description. They argue, again, with a, with a straight face, that they are intellectually superior and that we are intellectually inferior. Mm -hmm. They seem to have a great belief along these lines. As a matter of fact, I would, I would like to find you a quote here. Let me see. Uh, let, let me read you something here from the Jewish press, the Brooklyn Jewish press. This same Prof. Adelson here, and he's talking about black studies which he thinks shouldn't exist on the, on the campus because it's totally unacademic, unscholarly. Listen to this, quote, the so-called professors who are the denizens 
of black studies departments are perhaps the least well prepared of any on the campuses across this country. The poor quality of their scholarship, which is indeed ludicrous, has made black studies programs across this country a source of ridicule in American education. There is not the slightest trace of scientific methodology or technique in the fraudulent productions of the denizens of black studies departments. It would be a pure waste of time to discuss the scholarship emanating from the black studies department. That's a Jewish press out of Brooklyn. So they're intellectually superior and black people by definition. This man has blown away an entire profession. He doesn't even make room for a single exception. The entire profession, by definition, once you have black studies, by definition, you're unscholarly, unprepared, intellectually inferior, and so on. Of course, they do make exceptions once in a while, and the exceptions tend to be Skip Gates and Cornell West. <laughs> Those are the two exceptions. As I was saying earlier, once my situation arose, the, the name of Gates began to appear over and over and over. In almost every single article I saw on myself, you know, Gates was in there somewhere. They would, they, would, they would always say, the book that Professor Martin is teaching has been, you know, has been rejected by all black historians or by the most of the major black historians. And the only historian, it's amazing, if I didn't read a hundred articles, I didn't read one. And the only black historian up to now they, they, they can come up with is, is Skip Gates. And he's not even a historian. Mm, <laughs> Skip Gates is not a historian. But they keep running this line that black historians are against the book. Cornel West, of course, has joined Gates now as a major defender of the Jews. In fact, I would like to try to find you a little quote somewhere here from, from, from Cornel West. There was a book put out by the Jews to counter the secret relationship between blacks and Jews. The, you know, when, when that book came out, the Jews put out their own book to try to counteract it. It was more a pamphlet than a book. But this book contained within it an article by Cornel West attacking black folk as usual from being anti-Semitic. Let me try to find something that uh, West had to say. Okay. West didn't only confine himself to blowing up black people around the question of the secret relationship. He also broadened his comments to take in all of what he considered the anti-Semitism of black folk generally. <coughs> One of the areas he talked about was the Crown Heights, the Crown Heights affair. Listen to Cornel West in this Jewish book. Okay. Quote, the vicious murder of Janker Rosenbaum in Crown Heights this past summer bore chilling testimony to a growing black anti-Semitism in this country. Now, he never mentioned the black kid who got killed. He never mentioned Gaga yeah, 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 yeah. Never. This is a black man right here. It's bad enough for the Jews to do this, but this is a black man writing in a Jewish publication. He never mentioned Gavin Cato. Never mentioned Angela Cato. Never mentioned Cato's father who was beaten up by the police trying to save his own son. Never. This is a black man. I mean, this is the depth to which black people are willing to go for a certain amount of financial gain from the Jewish powers that be. So even though, like I say, we are in a position now of, of unprecedented consciousness, we are also at the same time facing what to me is one of the most concerted efforts on the part of the establishment to manufacture these black figures to use against this rise of consciousness. And perhaps the fact that people like Gates and West have been given the kind of prominence they have been given, this fact in itself, I suspect, is an indication of how great the consciousness, the positive consciousness is, because the positive consciousness we are experiencing now is so great that they have to go to even greater, you know, um, extents to try to prop up and promote people like Gates and West. And the kind of uh, resources they have poured into Gates and West are absolutely stupendous. Mm -hmm. 
Now, when my case arose, in the middle of my case, the Boston Globe, all of a sudden, for no apparent reason, ran a huge two-page spread on Gates. No apparent reason. <laughs> and the idea, of course, was just to, you know, to counter what was happening at Wesley, and of course, um, elsewhere around the country as well. And in this article, they listed all of the benefits that Gates had obtained from taking the position that he has taken. No Booker T. Washington. You know, that, that, that made him a full professor at the age of 33, I think. That given him an endowed chair in about three major universities, one after the other, including Harvard. That given him the MacArthur Foundation uh, grant, something they call a genius grant that gives you tens of thousands of dollars to do anything you want with. Most grants are for a specific research purpose, but this particular grant, they just give you half a million dollars or whatever and say, let's take it, do whatever you want to do with it. If you want to go and sit on a beach, you know, in the Caribbean for a year, that's okay. You know, if you think you are a great genius, you deserve this money. That's what that grant is about. The genius grant, they call it. He had gotten a Rockefeller Foundation grant. You know, he was head of the Du Bois Institute at Harvard. He was um, elected into the American Academy of uh, something or other. You know, um, since then apparently he's also been elected into other prestigious bodies. I saw in the papers a couple of days ago where he's on a board of about 20 different corporations and museums and all kinds of things. But the, you know, the rewards of this position are absolutely stupendous. <coughs> and the point I make is that the rewards of doing the bidding of the power structure are as great as the hassles you will get for opposing the power structure. Mm. Either way, they go all the way. If you oppose them, they hit you with everything they got. If you come out for them, they give you everything that they have to give. There's no in between. And of course, there'll always be those who choose to take the rewards. You know, that's the easier way out. The question arises, I'm not going to stop talking soon. The question arises, um, you know, what to make of all this. You know, it seems to me that at least some conclusions can come from all this. Before I conclude, though, let me just say one last thing in terms of the Jewish racism. One of the things that, that I have done in this book that I don't think has been done before is I have published one or two <coughs> letters from the Jewish hate mongers who were writing me hate mail over the last several months. And I suspect that some of this hate mail may come as a kind of a surprise to a lot of people. Let me just read you a couple of letters I got from Jews. <laughs> So-called Jews, European Jews. Okay, this letter has no date. Filthy nigger ape. Yeah, so what? Jews finance the slave trade. I plead guilty. Who gives a shit except liberal, self-hating nigger ass kissers? As for me, I hate dirty nigger apes. Hope's AIDS destroys your accursed race. I'm glad 23 million apes died on slave ships, etc. Filthy nigger simian pigs have destroyed America with their rapes, looting, murder, Neanderthal conduct. And Tony Kuhn, yows, Y-O-U-S-E, yows, chips, smells. Niggers have no redeeming value and should be castrated, <laughs> sent back to Africa, or drowned. I hate niggers to my very bone marrow. <laughs> Not all Jews debate apes. Some of us want them all to die. Never again. We are Jews who hate coons. That's one letter. Let me read you one more if you can deal with it. Niggers versus water buffalo. Number one, huge lips. Number two, huge nostrils. Three, black eyes. Four, white night teeth. Five, all the above. Answer, five, all the above. White Jesus and 13 white apostles. 13 white apostles. As are all whites are superior people. Genesis 9, 25 to 27. This is the Hamitic myth, but given a different twist now. Cursed be the nigger Canaan. A slave of slaves shall he be to his brothers for all eternity. God enlarged Japheth and Shem. 
and let Canaan and its issue for all time be their slaves. Now that last quote, of course, is the Hamitic myth. And the interesting thing about the Hamitic myth, the Hamitic myth comes from the book of uh, Genesis, where Noah supposedly curses uh, Canaan, the son of Ham, and says that Canaan will indeed be a servant of the sons of Japheth and Shem for all eternity. Now the interesting thing about that is that that was turned into a rationalization for enslaving black people. Somebody came along and took that story and decided that Ham had to have been the first black man. So Cain and his son had to be black. And therefore, God was cursing black people for the rest of time. Now, there's nothing like that in the Bible story, but this is an interpretation that was placed on the Bible story. <clears throat> and who invented that interpretation, do you think? <laughs> Give me one guess. That Hamitic myth, this association of Africans with this Hamitic myth, was invented by the Jewish Talmudic scholars between the 2nd and 5th century AD. The people who wrote the Talmud, they're the ones who invented the rabbis, the so-called sages, the Jews call them the sages. The Talmudic sages, they're the ones who invented the Hamitic myth. They invented the Hamitic myth a thousand years before our Atlantic slave trade started. Mm. A thousand years before. Teach, teach. Now, I read a dissertation, a PhD dissertation, by a Jewish writer called Brackman, who, um, you know, gave the origin of the Hamitic myth. And I want to quote him, because he is no ordinary Jew. This guy, Brackman, is the guy who they got to write the book Refuting the Secret Relationship. I quoted Colonel West a couple minutes ago from that book, Refuting the Secret Relationship. Well, the book that Colonel West was writing that foolishness in about Crown Heights was a book written by this guy called Brackman. This Brackman works for the Simon Wiesenthal Center in California, the Nazi hunters. So here's the same Brackman, a very authoritative Jewish source. Usually when you quote a Jew against them, they say, oh, he's a minor historian. Sure. Mm. Well, I want to hear them say that Brackman is a minor historian, since he's the one that used to attack the secret relationship. So here's what Brackman has to say about the Hamitic myth, about these rabbinical so-called sages inventing the Hamitic myth. What the Hamitic myth shows, of course, is that you have a very ancient strain of anti-African racism, you know, among the Jewish group, long before even our slave trade. And once our, once our slave trade started, then, of course, the Jews and the Gentiles who were running our slave trade, they then reached back into this Hamitic myth and kind of revived it and then used it now as a pretext for our slave trade because the pretext was that since we were cursed by God, therefore they could justifiably enslave us. That's where the Hamitic myth was used. So my argument is that the Hamitic myth actually killed more Africans than anything else. Mm -hmm. Because it was a Hamitic myth that was at the very basis, that was the intellectual mm -hmm. justification yes, for the slave trade. Teach. So the Hamitic myth then killed more Africans, whether it's one or two or three hundred million, than any other aspect of the slave trade. Mm -hmm. It was at the very heart of the slave trade. And here's Brackman, the Jew, documenting that it was the Jewish rabbis and the sages who invented this uh, Hamitic myth. Let me quote Brackman here. There is no denying, he says, that the Babylonian Talmud was the first source to read a negrophobic content into the episode, that is into the, you know, Hamitic business, the Noah story, by stressing Canaan's fraternal connection with Cush. Cush was supposed to be African. Now these Jewish rabbis, I mean, one wonders what kind of rabbis they were. Rabbis are supposed to be holy people, but based on the evidence of Brackman himself, the Jew, there was a level of, of, of madness and sexual craziness in the minds of these people that defies imagination. Here is a direct quotation from Brackman concerning some of the kinds of explanations that these Jewish rabbis gave for black people being turned black, because as far as they were concerned, black people were made black as part of this curse. Part of the curse of Noah 
was to turn us black. Our blackness, you know, is, is part of that curse that Noah gave. So listen to this. The most, sorry, the more important version of the myth, however, this is the whole Hamitic myth as invented by the Jewish rabbis. The more important version of the myth, however, ingeniously ties in the origins of blackness and of other real and imagined Negroid traits with Noah's curse itself. According to it, that is this, this rabbi's um, theories, Ham is told by his outraged father, that is by Noah, that because you have abused me in the darkness of the night, your children shall be born black and ugly. Because you have twisted your head to cause me embarrassment, they shall have kinky hair and red eyes. <laughs> because your lips jested at my exposure, theirs, that is your children's lips, shall swell. And because you neglected my nakedness, now according to the Genesis story, Noah got, you know, um, drunk in the tent or wherever he was, and he took his clothes off, so he was lying down there naked, and Ham came in and looked at him while he was naked. That's the reason why Noah cursed him forever, because he looked at Noah naked. So come back to the rabbis now. Because you neglected my nakedness, they, that is your black children, shall go naked with their shamefully elongated male members exposed for all to see. But the Talmud, as far as I know, is supposed to be the most holy book of the Jews, more holy than the Bible itself. And these are the guys who wrote the Talmud. That, that's, what, that, you know, that's the kind of madness that goes into their theology. So I'm not sure what you make of that. But what I find fascinating is that some of the people who were writing me hate mail were, in, in a sense, saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. What I read earlier was just a modern version of this same rabbinical foolishness. So there's an, an, an amazing connection there and a continuity. It's amazing. And this, to my mind, is, you know, is, a, is a good piece of evidence, possibly, for the authenticity of some of the hate mail. But these folks were clearly aware of this tradition. Right. They might even have read Black, uh, black One uh, themselves, I don't know. So where does this all leave us? I don't know. What, what this means, of course, I believe, is that, as I said before, um, black folk historically have represented for Jews a kind of a, a comfort level in America, you know. By, by them jumping on us, it has enabled them to gain acceptance into the white mainstream. And that's one of the reasons, I think, why they have been so hostile over the years to any black organization preaching self-reliance, because the data that black community becomes self-reliant, economically strong, and no longer in a situation to need either their assistance or their paternalism or their anything. You know, that kind of a black community that can fend for itself, I think, removes from them a kind of a shield which they have, uh, you know, placed before themselves. Some people also argue that, of course, by trying to intervene in our civil rights movement, they were, in a sense, fighting their own battle through us. Some historians, including some of their own historians, point out that they were actually some of the biggest beneficiaries of whatever the laws were passed during the civil rights era. <coughs> I've read, and I, I haven't, you know, sort of uh, investigated this independently, but I have read that many Jews were excluded from major white law firms, for example, prior to, to the 60s. And it was the civil rights laws that enabled them to get entree at that level and so on. The most fascinating thing I've read along these lines <coughs> is that even the rise of black power benefited Jews, although they mobilized greatly against black power. But there's a black historian called, uh, sorry, a black sociologist, Oliver Cromwell Cox, who's dead. But one of the last articles he wrote in the 50s, in the 60s, sorry, or was it the early 70s? Might have been late 60s, early 70s. But Oliver Cromwell Cox wrote an article in which he pointed out that what black power did for this country was that it forced this country to do away with the whole melting pot foolishness and to acknowledge that there were you know, different ethnic entities in this country that had valid, you know, um, valid claims to their own history and culture and so on. In other words, what black power did was to force on this country a sort of a plural 
framework, what sociologists call a plural framework. That this is not a melting pot, but you have to take everybody's individual, you know, different sort of ethnic background into consideration and respect it. And what Oliver Cox said was that this gave Jews now a certain opening to run their own independent land, which they will always run anyway. But in the past, in Europe, one of the reasons why Jews were so oppressed in Europe is because very often, you know, Europeans considered them unassimilable. They always refused to become part and parcel of the wider society. They want their own quarter to live in, their own schools, their own cemetery, their own everything. And, you know, while nevertheless benefiting from the society anyway, and, you know, in a sense living off of it. And this has been a source of great conflict between white Gentiles and Jews historically. But what Cox argued was that when black power legitimized the concept of a plural America in which every group could do their own thing, it then gave the Jews now an opening to openly do their own thing without fear of being vamped upon by the power structure because it was now okay to do your own thing in a plural society. And what Cox says is that the Jews then <coughs> went with that concept and began to encourage white ethnic groups to begin to declare their own ethnicity and so on as a cover for them to continue doing their own thing in the way that they have always done very well. So it seems to me that the message for black folk is clear. The black folk, it seems to me, cannot continue to be the pawns in anybody else's game. Black folk cannot continue to provide a comfort level for anybody else. I think we have to continue to do what we have striven to do for many years, but we have to strive with even greater might, and that is to build a self-reliant uh, community, which will become empowered. And let other folks fend for themselves, but let us not be anybody else's shield against their perceived oppression. Thank you very much. sisters, you can see why they would have to come with everything they have after a brother like this. He gets his stuff together and lays it out where even a fool can understand. I have a few...